This is the Ask EFF panel, so uh, check to see if you're in the right place. We are the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, we're very proud to have uh, an opportunity to be here at DEF CON. We love coming here. We view this as, you know, our people. We don't have to actually explain what we do here at DEF CON. People actually already understand it, and that's just wonderful for us. Um, uh, this is the Ask EFF panel, so we're not going to talk very much. I've asked each of the lawyers who are with me tonight and Seth Schoen, who's one of our technologists, to give maybe two minutes about uh, a particular topic that, you're w that we're working on so you can hear a little bit about, and then we want to open it up for questions. Um, so I'm going to have each of the lawyers give a short presentation, and then we're going to show a little video that we did um, about uh, your tools and, and why you should stand up to defend them. Um, and while that's playing, if you have questions, why don't you go ahead and line up, and when the video's done, we'll just take questions for the rest of the time. Um, a couple of rules. Um, this is your chance to ask the EFF attorneys questions, however, if you've got a serious legal problem, don't do it in a public place. You do not have the attorney-client privilege if you ask us in front of a hundred strangers about your legal problems. If you have a real legal problem, please come see us privately and we'll be happy to sit down and talk with you. We not only help people, but we do a lot of work finding lawyers for people. Okay, relax. And we're, we're happy to do that, but please do not reveal any of your secrets or anything you've done wrong. This is not confession time. So please do not uh, do that. Uh, my name is Cindy Cohen. I'm the legal director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to give a special welcome to all the members of law enforcement who may be with us in the audience here tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Um, how many people here are Electronic Frontier Foundation members? Yay for you. Thank you very, very much. And the rest of you, why not? Hopefully by the end of this we'll be able to do that. How many people have ever used our Action Center and sent a letter to your congressman or, or somebody? Thank you. Thank you very, very much. We, uh, when, we, when we go to try to argue for something in Congress in front of an agency, um, we really stand on the shoulders of all the people who take action uh, on EFF so that you know, I can stand up and say, I, you know those, you know, those 5,000 letters you got? I'm the person you have to talk to about the issue that those constituents of yours raise. So you really, you really raise us up so that we have a lot more mm -hmm. leverage when you take action on these things. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, without further ado, I want to talk a little bit about one of the issues that I'm working on at EFF and then we'll go through the lawyers and they'll each give a little spiel. I wanted to talk a little bit about electronic voting machines. Um, uh, as, as I think most people are aware of now, and if not, you should be, the electronic voting machines that are now being introduced in jurisdictions across the country are far less secure than the slot machines out there in this casino. Most of them are built on Windows 2000 systems. Uh, <laughs> I don't see, do you see why I love DEF CON. I, it, say no more, right? Uh, this is not a secure system. It's not a way to make sure your vote is being counted as cast. This is an issue that EFF picked up early on um, and we've been working on now for several years. It doesn't show any sign of ending. We've had some great successes. We've got 26 states to pass laws requiring a voter verifiable paper trail for electronic voting systems. It's not the only solution, but it's the best one we have right now. It's a very good start. Um, but we have a lot more to do because we've, we've had uh, all sorts of craziness like uh, people uh, doing an electronic voting machine with a voter verified paper trail and then they refuse to actually count the paper saying it's a little too hard for them to do that. So we've got a lot work, more work to do to shore that up, um, but we, we've had some great victories so far. Uh, last year we, we uh, basically scared the, uh, the, the worst of them all, the, the voting company known as Diebold, out of the state of North Carolina with some litigation that we brought there. Um, and thank you. Um, and we're continuing on. This is an issue that I think people don't like to think about in between elections, but EFF is there in the trenches and in quiet, uh, even when times are quiet working on that issue, and we're going to continue to do so. Um, I know there's a panel, I think, Sunday morning um, on electronic voting uh, with a guy named uh, Mr. Hansen, who is uh, from the Accurate Project. Um, it's a great topic and he knows a lot about it, so if you're interested in that, I, I suggest you catch that. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce Kevin Bankston and he's going to talk a little bit about some of what he's doing at EFF. Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm a staff attorney working on free speech and privacy issues. Most of my time right now is devoted to our lawsuit against AT&T. Uh, thank you. In case you haven't heard, uh, we allege that NSA has owned Zord AT&T's network. 
and uh, the, uh, with AT&T's permission, in which case I'm not really sure they're owning it. A uh, little semantic problem there. Um, but, uh, and also that AT&T is disclosing uh, the entirety of its database of records about who you call and who you email and when and for how long, et cetera, et cetera, in violation of a laundry list of longstanding statutes and uh, the Fourth Amendment uh, of, of the Bill of Rights. Um, this is going to be a long, hard case, and we're finding it very long and hard. Uh, but the, the conventional wisdom was that when the government intervened in our case, arguing that it should be dismissed because our case would reveal state secrets, that we were going to get our asses kicked. Um, but we kicked ass. We got a decision. Um, thanks. Uh, two weeks ago, we got a great decision from Judge Vaughn Walker in the Northern District of California saying our case was not going to be dismissed. It was going to go forward. Um, now that's going, of course, to uh, appeal, and that'll probably end up before the Supreme Court before it's said and done. Um, but like I said, we're going to fight it long and hard. The problem is now there's a bill working its way through Congress that could uh, end the game. Uh, it would essentially give the president a blank check or at least a very, very large check when it comes to foreign intelligence surveillance. And more, most relevant for us, it would shuffle our legal challenge and all the other legal challenges involving the NSA program into a secret court in D.C., which its only job for the past 30 years has been to secretly approve government applications for wiretaps. So basically, forum shopping of the worst kind, they want to put them all in the one court most likely to legitimate what the president's been doing. Um, so if, if you walk out of here with one action item, it needs to be this. Go to our action center uh, and call your senator and say you oppose the Specter-Cheney bill. Um, and if you want to learn more about that bill and learn more about our case against AT&T, we do have a panel specifically about that uh, at noon on Sunday. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to really talk about anything else right now other than to say one other fun issue we're working on is cell phone tracking. The government apparently has been routinely tricking judges into giving them orders to track cell phones location without a warrant, without probable cause, based on legal arguments that the courts are now calling, uh, thanks in part to our briefing, uh, unsupported, misleading, contrived, a Hail Mary so convoluted as to be perverse, and so convoluted as to be likened to a three-well bank shot in pool. Um, <laughs> this just goes to show that when the government is the only person making the argument in closed proceedings, um, they push the line as far as they can. It's our job to push back, and uh, it seems we're doing a pretty good job of it. Thanks to you. Thank you. Next up is Kurt Opsahl. Hello, I'm Kurt Opsahl, a staff attorney with uh, EFF, uh, working on free speech uh, and privacy issues. Uh, I'm also working on the AT&T case, but what I wanted to talk to you about uh, were a couple of cases that we worked on over the last year that uh, you might find interesting. Uh, one is the uh, Apple v. Doe's case, and this is a case uh, involving a subpoena to online journalists for their confidential sources. Uh, Apple uh, 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 sued uh, some Doe's, unknown people, presumably uh, employees who had leaked some information about an upcoming product. Uh, th this was uh, written up in some uh, online uh, magazines, uh, as is often the case before uh, Macworld. Uh, these things leak out and, and get published. But in this case, they, they filed suit, they issued some subpoenas, and uh, uh, attempted to argue that uh, uh, these uh, journalists did not uh, deserve the uh, reporter's privilege. It shouldn't be applied to them. Uh, we fought back. Uh, we took that through the California Court of Appeal and got a great decision that uh, upholds and defends the, the rights of online journalists to uh, uh, protect the confidentiality of their sources. Uh, it uh, uh, fought back against a, a trial court decision that had made the, uh, the privilege inapplicable where someone asserts trade secret rights. Uh, and uh, uh, the decision was uh, so good that uh, uh, Apple decided not to appeal it further. Uh, and, and so we, we've now come to a final decision on that. The second issue uh, that we, we worked on was uh, uh, the Sony uh, uh, rootkit uh, debacle. Uh, as you may recall, uh, uh, late last year, uh, it, it became known uh, uh, that uh, uh, Sony had placed a, uh, a rootkit on uh, uh, some of its, uh, as part of some of its DRM. 
uh, digital rights management software, software designed to stop you from being able to uh, easily uh, copy their, their disks. Uh, and in, in addition, um, that was one, one type of, of, uh, of software. We, we uh, did a further investigation with the help of uh, ISEC partners uh, and, and their good work. We're able to find a, another security flaw in the uh, MediaMax uh, software, which was their, their second flavor of DRM that Sony was using, uh, where they had a, uh, enabled a privilege escalation attack. Uh, brought that also to the attention of Sony uh, and uh, were able to uh, get them to get a patch out uh, for it. We, we eventually were able to reach a settlement with Sony where uh, they are not issuing this uh, DRM uh, anymore. They are reconsidering their entire DRM strategy. Those who bought the uh, defective discs can get their music uh, in an unencumbered format and, and uh, uh, we're, we're pretty pleased at how that works out. We hope that it sends a message to uh, uh, other companies that uh, are considering using DRM in their software. Thank you. Next up is one of our intellectual property lawyers, Jason Schultz. Hey there. So um, I'm Jason Schultz. I work on more of the intellectual property side of issues at EFF. And for uh, those of you who don't know, that <clears throat> used to be something people didn't think was such an affront to maybe freedom, uh, but I think most of you know that intellectual property can be used to shut down a lot of people doing a lot of interesting, useful, and socially beneficial things. Uh, one of the things I do is a project called the Patent Busting Project, and um, so you can check that out more on uh, our site, but um, just recently there's been a lot, of, lot more patents issuing on all kinds of things that shouldn't be issued on, but also there's been a lot more threats. In fact, just recently um, a company called Blackboard has started going after university content course management systems, including open source uh, based systems. And so there's going to be a lot more of that going on where uh, uh, the so-called patent trolls are actually going to go after all kinds of people, not just the Microsofts of the world, but small little projects as well. So we'll be watching that. Uh, a couple other things I wanted to mention. Um, what, there's a case going on in Oklahoma where uh, a uh, single mom has fought back against the RAA and got her case dismissed. So we're going to be supporting her and she's going to ask for her attorney's fees back and we'll hopefully get a little money back from the RAA on that. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, yeah, so hopefully that'll start a precedent so we can uh, start to shift that balance a little bit. Um, also, there are a lot of lawsuits going on right now around, uh, against Google for some of its indexing and searching capabilities and things like that. And uh, we're definitely involved in that to the extent that we want to make sure that um, your ability to access and index information that you find on the web or elsewhere stays free and open and that copyright holders can't come and shut you down for that. Um, and then I just want to flag one issue. It's not a real case that we're involved with right now. A few things have popped up, but uh, just for on the radar, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, intellectual property litigation, I think, in virtual worlds, virtual gaming worlds, Second Life, things like that. So we're definitely keeping our radar on for that as well, because I think there's going to be uh, a few people who get into fights on there, if you know what I mean. Thank you. Thanks. And next up is our brand spanking newest attorney. Marsha Hoffman has just joined us, and we've just opened a small EFF office in Washington, D.C., where she and another lawyer will be working out of it. And they're going to be focusing on trying to open up this government to get its secrets out and get as much of that information out to, to us, the members of the public, so we can make informed choices about our government again. Marsha? Hi there. My name is Marsha Hoffman. Um, as Cindy mentioned, I am EFF's newest staff attorney. This is my fourth day on the job. <laughs> it's a great place to be, my fourth day on the job, speaking at DEF CON. Um, I'm happy to be here, and I'm, I'm glad you all are excited about what we do. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the project we're going to be doing out of Washington. Um, there's this law that some of you may be familiar with called the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA. Uh, this is a federal law that gives everyone the right to ask the government for information about what it does. And we are going to use this law to submit a bunch of requests for information about the government's development of technology, the government's use of that technology to conduct surveillance on the public, and uh, the private sector's cooperation with the government to conduct that kind of surveillance or to otherwise infringe upon Americans' rights. And we are gonna make this information public uh, the documents that we get, we're going to uh, put on our website. We're going to make them available to uh, decision makers in Congress and other places. And we're going to make them available to the press. 
so that they can report on what we find and also uh, develop investigative uh, journalistic endeavors. So um, I hope that uh, you all will keep an eye out for what we're doing. And um, you know, of, of course, one of the big uh, things that's important in our work is coming up with ideas uh, for what to ask for. And if any of you have ideas uh, for things that EFF should uh, make FOIA requests about, by all means, uh, pull me aside while I'm here, while you're here, or uh, send me an email. Thank you. Now, what a great place to work, right? Your fourth day, and we bring you to DEF CON, and we put you on stage. Now, come on. Yeah, buy Marsha a drink. She's a good egg. So the last person is, uh, is Seth Schoen, and Seth uh, has the uh, uh, great distinction of being the only non-lawyer on our panel. Seth, EFF is... Thank you. EFF has lots of lawyers, but we also have quite a few techs, and Seth is, is one of our favorites, um, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the more te some technical stuff that we're up to. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to, short, uh, wanted to show you a movie, a cartoon, that some of our colleagues have put together. I'm a little worried about the volume level, because earlier it was kind of blasting. So let's give it a try, and I apologize if your ears get blasted a little bit. Um, <laughs> This cartoon was developed for primarily non-technical audiences. So um, if you as a technical audience are amused by that, you can take it as a sort of ironic thing or <laughs> feel cynical about it or something. But it was designed certainly, as you'll see, for a non-technical audience. OK, we're live to the future in five. Oh, that's pretty loud. He said he can do it. I can't no, quite. it'll do it. He said OK, he thanks. Except I can't see what I'm doing because I don't have it on here. Okay, there it is. There we go. Okay. Okay, we're live to the future in five, four, three. In 2006, the entertainment industry asked the government to give them incredible new powers. But here in the future, those superpowers have become the corruptibles. <laughs> No one is safe. Take the innocent act of making a mix CD for your loved one, made from those tunes you heard on your new digital radio. The law says that's legal. But under the music industry's digital radio laws, the Corruptibles can stop any receiver that helps you record particular songs and many other legitimate uses. Looking forward to high-definition digital TV in the future? If you value your freedom to use TiVo and other gadgets, you'll be disappointed. Take the bunny! Take the bunny! Sure, kids. I know it's your favorite. Under the broadcast flag law, the Corruptibles can keep any digital TV recorder that isn't Hollywood approved out of your hands forever. Even computer-savvy kids making amazing school projects have to be on the lookout. The movie industry's analog hole bill requires anti-copying spy chips to be included in computers by law. Digitizing even a short sample is detected by the corruptibles and eliminated. future, new superpowers everywhere, fighting innocent consumers, breaking new gadgets. Is there anyone out there who can fight back? Over to you in the present. Remember, the corruptibles are not real, but the powers they're using could be. Don't let the entertainment industry try this at home. Find out more about the proposed laws and call your representative now. So I go to a lot of meetings where I actually fight against some of these people, and it might be kind of cool if they had the superpowers, although I might not escape with my life. But uh, as it is, actually, the corruptibles are sort of stand-ins for people who wear suits and uh, are lawyers and get paid to go to meetings in industry groups around the world. And it's a little less exciting than the heat vision, and the, but they have their own lawyer superpowers. And our lawyers have you know, our own lawyer superpowers too, so it's pretty great. <laughs> so, as the movie suggests, um, you might have thought that things were bad enough with the DMCA and that the DMCA provided a depressing enough rule and a depressing enough regime for 
technology regulation. But it turns out that the movie industry and the recording industry are not satisfied and they have not been willing to stop there. Uh, and they're still every day engaging in legislative advocacy, trying to get even more powers and more restrictions that go beyond the DMCA. And there are these three specific areas uh, in which this legislation is a very real threat to existing devices that you can buy now and use now. Uh, and we're fighting these and we really need help in this advocacy. We really need people to contact legislators and to say, you know, I thought the entertainment industries already had plenty of power uh, and now they want to ban our ability to record analog video, uh, our ability to, well, the digital radio one is complicated because they don't like the idea that you can pick out a particular song. They say you should be able to record, but as long as you don't know what's on the radio, and as long as you can't pick out particular songs by name or by artist. Uh, so the devices need to be built specifically so that they don't tell you that in the user interface uh, as a way of you know, setting a recording preference. Uh, and then for digital television, we've been fighting the digital television broadcast flag for four years, almost five years now, ever since it was first proposed. Um, as many of you may be aware, together with the American Library Association and Public Knowledge, uh, we beat the FCC in court and got the court to throw out the broadcast flag rule. And that happened uh, over a year ago now. But the movie industry is right back in Congress uh, asking for Congress to write a new law that will give the FCC power to do this. Uh, and among legislators, that law is not considered terribly controversial because industry, uh, large parts of industry have accepted it as inevitable. Uh, so we really need to help from the public to say, not only is this not inevitable, it's a ridiculous idea. Um, so we have our action center, action.eff.org, which several people have mentioned here, uh, provides information about some of the bills that we're currently concerned about or interested in and means of contacting legislators. Uh, you can also find out, uh, you can ask us, you can come to our booth, you can read on our website about devices that are currently threatened by legislation. You can go out and buy them while you can still get them. Uh, even simple things like a video card that can record from an analog input is something that people have tried to ban in its present form. Uh, the Slingbox uh, and a nice device called the Neuros that lets you lawfully get things like DVD onto a video iPod or a portable player. All of these things are under threat. Uh, also, for those of you who are electrical engineers, you can build some of these things, uh, help make them more available to people while that's still lawful. Uh, and we look forward to talking to all of you about what we can do about this to try to stop the entertainment industries from getting even further additional powers over technology. Thanks a lot. Okay, so this is the ask part of the Ask EFF panel. So if you've got questions, please line up in front of the microphone so the audience can hear your questions as well as our answers. That makes things work better. Um, and uh, we'd be happy to take as many as we can while the time arrives. By the way, we do have a, a booth uh, over in the Schwag area over there, and you're welcome to come visit us. There's also a dunk tank outside. It's a little hidden. You have to go back through the game room, and there's a little outside courtyard. Um, there's going to be a dunk tank going throughout the weekend, and all the proceeds for the dunk tank go to the Electronic Frontier foundation so it's a way to not only get your friends wet but do uh, a little something good on the side as well um, yes hi I think this one's for uh, Jason in particular um, I'm sorry did I get your name right yeah. okay um, a lot of higher education institutions use products like uPortal or Sakai or open source portal type systems what do you think Blackboard is actually going to do are they going to go after those companies directly or perhaps use fear tactics to get um, universities to switch to other products such as Blackboard um, yeah, so that was the lawsuit actually I mentioned, so thanks for bringing it up. Um, it's a little unclear exactly what they're going for now. I think a lot of it's just intimidation. I mean, Sakai and some of these other projects are, I think, are, are pushing them in, you know, in the marketplace to have to innovate and have to kind of keep up, maybe lower their prices. And I think this is their sort of shot across the bow. But they are suing people, so we'll see. I mean, from what I can tell, and actually what's sort of interesting, people have already created a Wikipedia page to post prior art on the patent, on the, con on the course management system patent, so we'll see how that goes. But I think it can almost have a backlash effect. Um, I think it's, it's just kind of a gut reaction. You get a lot of these companies who once they acquire intellectual property, I feel they have to assert intellectual property. It's like a gut reaction without even thinking it through. So 
It's hard to know, um, but Blackboard's actually sued lots of people for lots of crazy reasons. Uh, they've sued a bunch of kids who reverse engineered something they did before, and and Georgia, and they, they're not really a good player in that sense. So I don't I don't ascribe any good motivations to them all. I think they're just trying to intimidate people and keep their market share. <coughs> Next, um, this question's kind of specific, but it's got some general principles that that would apply. Um, my company does open source hosting specifically multimedia audio and video. So we get a lot of patents and uh, yes, some of our stuff is uh, broken DRM, so we've gotten uh, DMCA takedowns and the like. Um, for people who host open source software, especially things that are likely to infringe, are there any um, steps that can be taken by, be, above and beyond the, uh, like the DMCA safe harbor provisions to try to limit how likely you are to have to take stuff down and get sued and the like? Well, on the on the patent front, the, the real problems with patent law right now in the sense that there really is no safe harbor and there's actually a reform bill that's sort of working its way through Congress. It's not fully formed yet, so hopefully that will have some help. I mean, the best thing you can do is to really be in touch with the creators of the code. If, you, if you're the people who manage the open source project, then you should talk to me. And if you're not, talk to the people who distribute uh, you know, the binaries that you run or whatever and, uh, and they should talk to me or other people because we're starting to do more work with them and helping them sort of figure out to, how to collect prior art and be prepared. Um, and also there's a place called the Public Patent Foundation that's also doing some of this um, as well. Uh, but it's kind of early on. There's really no magic shield that you can have. It's a really rough area. I mean, the best thing you can do is prepare as much as possible so when you get that nasty letter, you know, we can write one back. That's kind of your best bet right now. Yeah. Well, if it's your software, you said some of it's his software, then you know, we can talk later and we can figure out. And there are some pro bono um, patent lawyers that I've been able to wrangle to give uh, advice and write letters and sort of help support efforts like yours. So we can also maybe uh, hook you up with one of them who can actually be kind of your lawyer if we can't do everything. Hi. I was wondering, is the EFF planning on doing anything to force corporations and government here in the United States to be more responsible as well as accountable for our personal financial data when it's overseas, especially in the hands of third party corporations overseas. Well, I, I don't, I mean, I, I think the short answer is not in the short term. Um, I would love to, and if you guys want to raise enough money for me to hire a couple more lawyers to work on that, I would like to take that issue on, because I think it's really important. I think that at the moment we're kind of maxed out on projects of that size. I apologize. I'd love to, you know, EFF is 25 people in a little office, and, and now we have two more in D.C., but in a little tiny office in the Mission District in San Francisco, I would like to be 10 times that size. Um, so this is my challenge to DEF CON, raise enough money to us so that we can be 250 people instead of 25. Um, and then we can take on a wider range of issues. Um, I think the financial issues are, 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 are important, uh, but I don't think we can take them on right now because I don't think I have the resources to do it well. Sorry. I wish this is the hardest part of my job, you know? The number of people who call EFF or email EFF with serious, important issues that they'd like us to take on that I can't take on, that's the hardest part of my job every single day is making the calculation um, about whether we have the resources to do something and do it well. Because when we take something on, we take it on and we stick with it. Um, so I'm not going to just say yes to everybody. We actually do a careful analysis before we do, these, do, do what we do because we wanna, we, we're in this to win. We're not in this just to, you know, raise the flag and then go on to the next whiskey bar. Hi. Uh, let me see. My question has two parts, and you can opt out of the whole thing by saying, wow, this is out of our scope, uh, if you'd like to. Um, this, this spring, there was a really red-hot uh, Freedom of Information Act request at George Washington University. It was uh, from the Pentagon, uh, uh, let me see, Joint Chiefs. Uh, the information operations roadmap where the internet was referred to regularly as an enemy combatant uh, by the Pentagon and uh, outlined, you know, ostensibly the Pentagon making internet <laughs> equivalents of nuclear weapons and that kind of thing to shut everybody down and do all kinds of other things as well as uh, stepping really far into uh, military psyops indirectly aimed at the American public. A, are you guys 
involved in do, taking any action to monitor or get involved with this kind of event. I mean, I know you guys are talking a lot about media things, which set all kinds of legal precedents, which are stepping stones into much darker territory. This is dark. Uh, and second, if you guys do have somebody involved in this, who are they? And what can we do to help? Fourth day on the job. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the best that I can say to that is I think it sounds like a very, very interesting subject for, for FOIA stuff. And, you know, I'd love to talk to you about it further. So, uh, you know, maybe this isn't the time to do it right now, but I mean, shots. why don't we talk a little bit? Yeah. All right. Shots. We'll do shots. Shots. <laughs> yeah. That's the way to go. Find me. So uh, at Bruce Potter's Black Hat and DEF CON talks, uh, he mentioned how the EFF and ACLU will sue companies that uh, do evil things with trusted computing. I think uh, his example was um, if a company required a, a remote attestation that you weren't running Mozilla Firefox on your machine before, it would give you, say, security updates or something like that. Um, he reassured us that uh, you guys would uh, you know, take care of that sort of. Uh, and he didn't really tell us what the legal theory uh, would be that you would use in that kind of challenge <laughs> and I wonder if you could tell us what the legal theory would be and uh, if uh, maybe that means that you guys are so excited now about remote attestation that uh, you think that maybe owner override isn't necessary because you've got this legal theory that uh, I love to hear about. You want to <laughs> take this? <laughs> well I would cool. I would refer to the lawyers over the question of legal theory. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, yeah, my suspicion is that it would be difficult to sue companies that abuse trusted computing because we've seen a lot of companies that have done things that are not necessarily in their customers' interests and there hasn't necessarily always been a legal remedy for that. So my impression hearing that earlier was that it's a very optimistic view of the law to think that EFF will always have a legal remedy against every company that does something against the interests of customers, whether that's through trusted computing or any other technological area. But, but um, yes, so Seth answered the legal part, so um, I think that's right. I mean, one of the areas of law that we've been concerned about lately is EULA law and user license agreements um, and the ways that con companies are using uh, click-throughs and other contractual arrangements um, to try to limit what you can do with their tools and to limit your remedies if uh, if they've restricted you through the tools. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that a, tr a, a situation in which uh, Microsoft, which um, they know how to do contracts, trust me on this, um, <laughs> was to sell you a product that does uh, require remote attestation before you can do things with it. Um, and you, you know, clicked through or signed or got a licensing agreement as part of that product um, that said that that was what you agreed to. Um, we'd have an uphill battle to get you out of that contract. Now, I'm not saying we wouldn't win and I'm not saying we wouldn't take it on, but I think that it's not appropriate for the proponents of trusted computing to say, pay no attention to the excesses and the problems that this product might cause because EFF will come to the rescue and everything will automatically be all right. Um, you know, we're good. We're damn good at what we do. But you guys have a responsibility as well not to create situations in which we have to come in and try to help people out. Um, and I think that it's not responsible computing to just assume that whatever problems your technology creates are going to get sorted out by the do-gooders over there in the Mission District in San Francisco. I think you have an affirmative obligation to protect um, and to work towards et to do ethical computing quite apart from the fact that we're here to try to do the excesses. And frankly, I find it a bit you know, troubling. I mean, I, we've got enough on our plate with the federal government, the you know, AT&T, Sony BMG, the patent trolls, you know, why do we have to take on the technology companies too? I mean, why can't they be on our side? Um, um, frankly, not our side, your side. Um, so I, I think that, you know, uh, so I mean, I think the short answer is certainly nothing that, uh, that, that, that Bruce said led us to think that we don't like uh, owner override anymore, which was uh, Seth's insight into one of the ways to deal with the problems with trusted computing. Um, uh, he certainly said nothing today that changes my mind about that. And in fact, I just, again, I think that we need to hold the people who are proponents of these technologies to a higher standard than to just throw off the possibility of problems and say, well, there's an EFF, so 
everything will ultimately be okay, even if I take no responsibility for making sure that people have tools that actually work for them as opposed to working against them. All right. Um, I'd like to know what the current legalities of encryption are in the U.S. and a bit of a stretch, uh, how that might differ with, say, Canada. I'm from Toronto. <laughs> Oh boy, encryption, uh, a, a topic near and dear to my heart for over 15 years. Um, so uh, the, 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 well, the, the short answer is it's a long answer, um, but um, depending on the, 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 you know, if you're doing open source um, crypto, uh, crypto where you've got a, a open source license agreement and you're giving it away in the United States, um, you have an extremely uh, trivial export analysis. So using encryption inside the United States and, and developing encryption inside the United States is, is completely legal and always has been. The problem has always come in the export of encryption. And the government has interpreted export very broadly, including things like posting it to the internet. Um, so that's that's why uh, you know a lot more things qualify as expert than, export than you might otherwise think. Um, so if you've got open source um, things and stuff that you're giving away, you're not selling crypto, um, you have a very easy process where you basically send an email to the Bureau of Export Administration saying, I'm exporting this crypto, um, talk to you later, and you can you can do it. Um, if you're selling crypto, it gets much more complicated, and there are lots of different levels, and the, the licensing gets more onerous depending on how you're doing it. It's still much, much better than it was when I first picked up this issue in 1994. We've, done, we've made great, great strides, but you'll need counsel if you're going to sell. Um, and uh, now... And similarly, if you're in Toronto and you want to publish stuff from there, come see me and we'll talk about it because I, I don't want to bore these people with the complications of the import of cri crypto back across the borders kind of issue. Okay, thank you. I think Richard Stallman would be grateful if I pointed out that under those rules, if you sell open source crypto, then that counts as open source uh, and you are allowed to do that without getting the more elaborate permission. Free software. <laughs> um, I was wondering what the current state of uh, getting arrested with a piece of like personal technology, um, like a smartphone or a thumb drive or a hard drive is. Uh, the last precedent that I had heard is that they'd been grouped into the class of like a pager due to uh, like early drug convictions where they'd gotten into the pager and you know had full access when the person was arrested. Is that true of kind of higher level devices that? A lot of us carry around that have email and gigs of information now. This is a pretty fairly, this is still a pretty developing area of Fourth Amendment law, but generally when you are arrested, uh, they can search you and all of your effects as an incident to arrest. And so far we haven't had a very good, uh, uh, good luck in getting courts uh, or the government to recognize that it's a very distinct, very different thing to be able to say, search your bag, which can hold a few things, or search your device, which can hold thousands upon thousands of personal files and soon you know we're going to be carrying hundreds of gigs on our persons I, I'm actually I'm sure there are some in here now who are probably <laughs> carrying hundreds of gigs on their persons and half you know, a terabyte with me yeah exactly um, <laughs> and, and we think that is that is that that should be treated differently and that if they were to seize things like that there should be a judge overseeing any search of that and that there should be probable cause for them to search any particular segment of your drive or any particular files but right now it is a very developing area of the law and there's no hard okay. rules small yet. small follow-up question actually um, with the encryption theme if something's encrypted on one of those pieces of technology can you be compelled that is also a really interesting question that we we'd probably love to litigate yeah. um, there are arguments that could be made that you could not be compelled um, but none of them been, have been tested yet but certainly if anyone here has something of theirs seized and the government is trying to compel them to reveal uh, their key yeah. give us a call for, for the love. record I, I lost all my DSA keys today so yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's a topic that we've been waiting for a right case, a ripe case to handle. Again, for probably close to 10 years, I've been watching and, and trying to find the right uh, case for it. Um, one of the things that happens often in criminal cases that makes it tough to turn them into uh, test cases is that the people often have other problems that they're dealing with other than the encrypted stuff, and they settle or they plea bargain out. And the issue that is interesting to us doesn't get become the center of the case. So it's not that it doesn't happen. It's that often the situation is so complicated that the issue that we really want to pull out doesn't become the focus of the case. So it's, that's, that's why we haven't found the right case yet, not, not for one of watching. 
I have another uh, patent question. I'm trying very hard to uh, convince my employer, who's a gigantic company, uh, to use GPL software wherever we can. And one of the concerns is, um, you know, according to one of the talks that Richard gave, he made a very good point. He said, it's impossible to write a program of non-trivial size and not violate some patent somewhere which implies that pretty much every piece of software is open for challenge. And so the company is concerned that if we do adopt GPL software internally and become dependent upon it, that it'll get be subject to troll or whatever <clears throat> and be a huge disturbance internally. And I'm wondering if there's a way around that or some kind of assurance I can give them that that's not going to be a problem. Yeah. Um, I think I might actually approach that the other way around, which is, it, any proprietary software you buy is going to have the same problem and I have yet to see any proprietary software vendor say they will indemnify their customers from patent infringement unless it's a private contract. I mean if you've contracted someone to develop software for you they might but Microsoft, Adobe, Apple, they won't, I mean any, you know, they won't protect you either. So I would say your best argument for using uh, GPL software or open source free whatever is to say that the risk is the same and if anything what will happen is if you get sued the community will probably rally around you. The, if you buy from a proprietary vendor they're going to be like ha sorry good luck with that. Uh, whereas I've seen in some of these other cases where uh, users of open source software get sued that there's a real ability for people to come out of the woodwork and support them, help find prior art, serve as experts, things like that. So you might actually engender some goodwill um, in, in that sense. Um, I mean, I think one example real quick that you can look at, not in the patent context, but more in, in the copyright is when uh, SCO, you know, started going after Linux and, and IBM stepped in uh, to defend, um, a lot of people actually got a different viewpoint of IBM as a company. Now, it's a little different because IBM was a distributor, you know, themselves of, of the binaries and things, but I think you could position a company so that you actually got a lot of support and goodwill from using open source so that if you were sued, you would have some resources. Thank you. And you could apply the uh, money you'd save on licenses to subsequent legal fees. Yeah. <laughs> or to EFF's patent busting project. <laughs> My question is, what is EFF doing on net neutrality? Uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll talk about this um, a little. Here's the thing, EFF doesn't have a, yeah, we own yeah, a what truck. about the tubes exactly? It's, it's not a truck, okay? I want to be clear about this. Um, so um, EFF doesn't have a formal position on net neutrality and I think that it's probably fair to, uh, fair to start with the, our, our board of directors to explain why. We have David Farber on our board of directors and we have Lori, Lawrence Lessig on our board of directors, two people whose opinion we respect tremendously who disagree very sharply on this issue. I'll tell you our uncomfortable, you know, in general, we're, we're, you know, we're fans of net neutrality. I mean, all pack, packets are packets and they need to be treated equally as they go across the internet. That's a fundamentally important principle. Um, the thing that is worrisome to us about the way the net neutrality debate is being is being is, is playing in Congress is that people want to give the ability to control and regulate the internet to the Federal Communications Commission. That's the solution that the pro-network neutrality people are doing. You can't tell that unless you look pretty deeply into what they're saying. You won't see it in the funny little flashes or the, the, the op-ed pieces that are being placed all over the place. But you know, we care about actually how things get implemented at EFF, not just the sound bites. What they're trying to implement is to give jurisdiction to the Federal Communications Commun Commission to regulate the internet, to regulate the packets on the internet and hope that the Federal Communication System uh, Commission, which has not stood up for consumers in the six years I've been at EFF and we've been fighting the broadcast flag, we had to sue them, remember, earlier because they were doing Hollywood's bidding and we won and now they're going to Congress to get this authority. Why do you want to give those monsters the ability to decide about whether packets are being fairly passed across the internet. This is the problem that we have. This is the struggle that we're having. Everybody at EFF is strongly in favor of network neutrality, but the devil's in the details about how you go about fixing it. And the current proposals in Congress right now make us extremely nervous. We've tried to lobby the FCC. We've tried to make sure that consumer, that your voices, that consumers' voices, ordinary people's voices are heard at that agency. And frankly, 
we haven't been successful. The people who are successful there are the people who have the money and who are the players. And the biggest players at the FCC right now is the duopoly. It's it's Verizon, it, it's the, the big telcos. So this is where we have uneasiness about the way the network neutrality debate is being framed right now. And that's why you don't see EFF having a, a, a upfront position. This is the, the source of our discomfort with the way the debate is playing out now. Um, we're watching it closely. Believe me, we're part of this. As I said, we've got two of the leading voices on each side of it on our board. There is a, an ongoing discussion at EFF in this. But that's why you haven't seen us out front on network neutrality. And I, you know, if we come up with a silver bullet solution, you'll see us. But we're still trying to figure figure out how to do it. But I don't think giving the FCC the authority to regulate the internet is the answer to this problem, or frankly, any other. A follow up comment. One one more example of why you probably don't want to trust the FCC to regulate the internet. They've also bent over for the FBI and DOJ in applying CALEA, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, to the internet to make all of the networks tappable. Um, these are not the people you want to hand this power to. Just a follow-up comment. Uh, as someone who has contributed to you guys for a long time, I am specifically looking to you for guidance for the industry. So I'm not necessarily looking for you to come down on one side or the other, but I'm a regular reader of Effector. I really want to see your position and elevate the conversation so that it didn't come up until now. I would like to see you the first thing when you come up to the table to say, I need to be talking about net neutrality so that we all understand what the issues are. Okay, um, we have a paper that's in the works right now, and 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 again, we, um, we're, we're I, I don't I can't give you a deadline on when we're going to come out on it because we really you know this is an important issue. It's a critical issue, and EFF we view ourselves as you know that you know we don't want to be irresponsible about what we say about this and 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 so um, I, I hear you and and we are working on it and I think you can you know uh, we'll we'll work on trying to get something out front about the you know our uneasiness and, and where where we see the issues all right thank you Hi, I have a question about um, government databases that track a lot of our personal information, the stuff that's both in the commercial sector and the banking and stuff like that, that they then will, uh, a lot of times the government can't directly access the information, so they'll cro uh, contact you know third parties to gather it and collect it for them. Um, I actually have two kind of two parts. One is, what's the current legal legality of them being able to gather a lot of this information in, into databases like we've heard about, like, you know, like TIA, Matrix, and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and then also, is there anything that we can do, like from a disclosure standpoint, so the stuff that they tend to try to keep out of the out of the public media, that we can try and bring that into um, the public forum? Okay. Uh, as to your first, the first part of your question, there is something called the Privacy Act, which requires the government um, to publish details when they build databases on, on U.S. citizens. Um, and to apply fair information practices such that you can find out what records they have on you, you can get them changed if they're incorrect, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is there are very broad carve-outs in that law for law enforcement and national security related databases. So in, in a lot of ways it's kind of the Wild West. Um, the latest uh, twist on this is that um, instead of developing their own databases, uh, FBI, DOJ, uh, probably, certainly, NSA. Um, they are now all clients of the data brokers, yeah, your choice that's points, that's your axioms, et cetera, et cetera. These are the companies that collect every possible record on you that they can. Their audience has typically been marketers. Now their biggest client is the government, particularly post 9-11. Um, this is a hard issue. It, it is primarily a policy issue, uh, which is why I'm glad you bring up how, how do we um, bring this into the public eye. I wish I had an answer to that. The fact is, it's been revealed that the NSA has compromised all of the major internet and phone switches in the country and no one gives a damn, uh, except for people like you. Um, how do you make people care? I don't know. Cindy, you got a good answer for that? I wish I had one. Well, I mean, we try, right? I mean, we make funny little videos and we come to speak and we, you know... And we, we sue people? We sue people. Um, <laughs> And uh, we try to, to as much as we can, but we've got a pretty tiny voice, you know. I mean, unfortunately, what you know, what it takes to get the public's attention in this country is a hell of a lot more money than my budget, right? You buy the TV ads, you buy the New York Times ads, or, or wherever, right? And and try to permeate the public. You know, I wish that I had the budget for one Celine Dion CD, right? The promotional budget for one Celine Dion CD. 
we could we can you know we could make a much bigger splash than we can make so we you know we're nimble we're quick we do as much as we can with the small resources that we have um, but I think that you know word of mouth is the best way viral virally viral marketing of these ideas you got to talk to your family you got to talk to your friends the best way to get people on this bandwagon is if a good fr trusted friend of theirs explains it to them and tells them why it's important and that that's priceless I think this is the last question, so. Okay. Um, Sorry. I, I just wanted to personally thank all of you um, for fighting the good fight in a legal way. <laughs> and, and it's really performing a great service for us all. But um, basically, I just want, you know, as you're progressing with what you do and, you know, making FOIA requests and, and uh, you know just all that stuff on a legal level and and all the difficulties that you know you encounter right with the culture of secrecy in the government um, and um, you know that that sort of thing um, just sort of on a feeling level and I, I'm directing this to each one of you individually could you briefly summarize kind of like what's the you know the, the strongest feeling that comes forth if you think back on, on what you've you know done so far, and maybe also for the future, are you optimistic, mostly frustrated, um, and also in a world that you know that, that the public kind of doesn't get these issues kind of like we do? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, sometimes I'm frustrated, admittedly. Uh, the trends are all in the wrong direction these days. You look everywhere you look, there's some new encroachment, some new privacy invasion invasion, some new way of stifling speech online. Um, that's frustrating, but it's also inspiring. It's why we're here. Um, and it just, and so every time we turn around and see that new awful thing, it just rededicates us and makes us care even more about what we're doing and realize that we made the right choice in being a part of EFF. Well, um Thank you for your, your kind words, and, and I think one of the things that, that, that uh, helps us uh, keep going is the support of, of people like yourself, like the, those in the audience. And we're trying to uh, fight, the, fight the good fight, and there's a lot of uh, uh, troubling things out there, uh, but uh, you know, we, we want to uh, not give anything up w without a fight and try and uh, uh, make a future that we would want to live in. Um, I think we're, we're, we're pretty much out of time, so. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you all. I'll tell you, one of the best things that we do every year is we come to DEF CON. We go back to EFF and we're so rededicated to working for you guys, so thank you.